We're going to look at Classical Greece, which is the period of the 5th century BCE. When folks refer to any culture as classical, it suggests the epitome of achievements, the very best that you can possibly get. And from the ancient world, the period of the 5th century, the classical period in Greece, is generally considered to be that epitome. It also tends to be a kind of standard against which we judge all cultures. It has become, in a way, the keystone for ideas of aesthetics. And the question is, how did we get there? How do we get to a classical period? And we actually get there because of a war. That war is going to be the Greco-Persian War. And in fact, in the 5th century, there will be two wars, one at the beginning of the 5th century and one toward the end of the 5th century. Both of those wars are going to permanently change the nature of the Greek world. So let's start with the Greco-Persian War. The Greco-Persian War is uh, going to begin when uh, some of the Greek colonists settle in a region uh, that will be taken over by the Persians. It will be in what we would call Anatolia or present-day Turkey. When the Persians conquer this region, the Greek city-states that had been there independently revolt and they write back to, they send messages back to the mainland asking for assistance. Well, the Greeks send help. The city-states led by Athens will send ships and men to fight against the Persians. Unfortunately for the Greeks, however, the Persians are going to be victorious. The Greek city-states rebellion will fail and it will leave the Persians with a sense that we've got to do something about these uppity Greeks. And when I say uppity, I do really mean it. Take a look at the map that I have. All of that orange color is the Great Persian Empire. This is vast. This is powerful, powerful army, powerful king. And it's going to be contested by some folks here. These little in comparison Greek city-states. So the Persians decide in the year 490 that they have to teach these pesky Greeks a lesson. They send a fleet and they anchor it at the city of Marathon, which is 26 miles from Athens. They are intent on marching to Athens to destroy it. Outnumbered, however, and we're talking two to one outnumbering here, which is pretty amazing. The odds definitely being on the Persian side. Outnumbered, the Athenians beat the Persians. According to tradition, I can't guarantee this is true, but according to tradition, when the victory of the Greeks was clear, what they did was to send a runner whose name was Pheidippides back to the city of Athens, 26 miles away, to bring the news of victory. Why did this matter so much? Well, if the Greeks had lost, the city would need to evacuate. So the people were waiting, uh, tensely waiting, for the news to arrive. Pheidippides ran full tilt, got to the city of Athens, delivered the victory news, and collapsed and died. Why does that matter? Well, Pheidippides went down historically as a heroic figure. Again, a reminder in the ancient Greek world that dying is not the problem. What you want, however, in your lifetime is to achieve something great. And Pheidippides did. He became a hero by running this distance to bring the news to the Athenians. It's also important that you die well, that you die in control of your emotions, and that you die in a moment, essentially a state of honor. And Pheidippides did those things. The memory of Pheidippides continues in the Olympic Games with the marathon, which is run every four years, and it features a 26-mile race, which imitates the distance that Pheidippides ran. So he's remained with us in spirit. The 
Persians, again, the greatest empire on the planet at this time, uh, decided that they couldn't let these Greek city-states get away with this. So in 480, 10 years later, what they decide to do is to send a serious fleet of men, and it is really a land and sea assault that they plan. It's the second invasion, and I'm talking a quarter of a million men. The goal was to march on the city of Athens, destroy it, and conquer and absorb the Greek world. For those of you who've seen the movie The 300, that takes place in this time period. There will be a pass that was held by Greek soldiers. Among those Greek soldiers in particular were 300 Spartans, hardened military men who tried to hold the pass against all odds. In the end, the Persians do pass through. They force their way through, and the Spartans, the 300, will die to the man. The Persians will march on the city of Athens and destroy it. This is when they go to the Acropolis, knock down those statues, and destroy all of the temples. It will be this event that will later cause the Greeks to need to rebuild, and that explains why we have those fragmentary pieces of sculpture. Shortly after this, however, uh, the Greek ships are going to crush the Persian fleet in the Bay of Salamis, which is off the coast of Athens. Uh, how are they going to manage that? Well, the Greeks were fishermen and sailors. They knew the waters. They had ships which were much easier to manage, and they lured the Persians into this body of water when the tides would be high and the water would be choppy. Uh, the Greeks knew how to swim, and guess what? The Persians did not. The Persians come from desert territory, and they had to bring very large overloaded ships to the region to ensure that they could get the men and equipment there that they needed. Consequently, they could not maneuver their ships well, and the Persians were soundly defeated. This ends the Persian threat. There are results of this that are incredibly important. Among them, the Greeks will become incredibly optimistic and self-confident. I might even say cocky because of this victory against the largest empire in town. Athens will be the leader of the Greek world because it had been the leader against the Persian assault. There is another consequence. Athens is going to need to rebuild because its city has been destroyed. Where is it going to get the money? Well, one of the places it's going to draw from is a kitty, a pot of money that will be collected under a protection league where all of the city-states are going to come together and add some money under the leadership of the city-state of the Athenians with the intention that there's money there if those Persians should ever come back. We're going to look now at the charioteer from Delphi, figure 538 in our textbook. This is very early in the classical period, but it takes place around 10 years after the war with the Persians. And what it does do is show the great optimism and the ideals of the ancient Greeks in this period. For one thing, quite simply, what we are looking at here is a winner. This is a dedication that was offered as a thank you to the gods. In this case particularly, I believe it was a dedication to the god Apollo. Um, as a god that favored this charioteer in the races, it shows the ideal figure, youthful, aristocratic, as he stands very erectly in a kind of timeless way with a great sense of pride. The textbook makes the point that this is not the race. This is not the time that the race is taking place. It is after the race, when this young driver is actually being honored for his victory. So he stands very calmly and very straightly in his chariot. It is, in other words, the absolute pinnacle of victory. Uh, as we look at this figure, I do want you to see it is kind of column-like, but I'd also like you to understand that the bottom of it, and that is probably up this far, would have been covered. Because originally this was a driver, and we're talking a driver that stands 5 feet 11, so it's almost 6 feet in height, 
all out of bronze, uh, and his horses, the full chariot, the reins, and there would have also, if you look over here, I have been a groom. Most of the rest of this has been lost, so you need to imagine it. And in particular, you need to imagine that we wouldn't have focused on the body of the driver. We would have focused on the torso, the top portion of this. And against the straight axis of his body, the head turns ever so slightly, giving this a sense of vitality and perhaps a bit of participation with the audience. However, at the end of the day, this is not the way a real athlete would react in the victory circle. If you think of the faces of gold winners at the Olympics today, you see them smiling, you see them jumping for joy, some of them crying, some of them waving to the crowds. This, however, reflects an ideal of the ancient Greek world in the 5th century BCE, where dignity and self-control mattered, where the ideal type of behavior was to control your emotions. And pretty much throughout the 5th century BCE in the classical period, uh, the figures on their faces are very calm, somewhat remote because of it, but definitely filled with dignity and control. This is a closer look at the face of the charioteer of Delphi. And despite the calm, you definitely can get a sense of the animation. Some of that comes from the inlaid eyes, which are made out of glass paste. And the fine details, look at the little details of the eyelashes around the eye. This is also an image that is definitely an example of ideal naturalism. It's certainly naturalistic. And let's take a look. Here, a closer look at the face, but also just take a look. This is an old photograph, but it is a pretty good photograph showing us the right hand of our driver holding the reins. It's pretty impressive in terms of the ability to capture what the artist actually sees. It also captures the ability of the winner, and he is indicated by as a winner by the band around his head by the winner to act in moderation with logic, with calm, and with very controlled behavior. The optimism of this and the focus on individual accomplishment and the fact that this guy is indeed a winner does reflect this attitude after the defeat of the Persians by the Greeks. There's a great sense that we can do anything. We are unstoppable. We are victorious. And that does show up in this particular image. You might be wondering, how did this survive? We only have portions of the whole, but how did the piece that we have survive? And the answer is, it was um, found under rocks that fell on it. In other words, a landslide that covered the entire monument at the site. Why is this even important? Well, it's because most of the bronze pieces from the ancient world have been melted down. This is going to occur during the period of the Middle Ages, when the Roman world had collapsed and along with it the infrastructure and there was a need for metal. So the Christian Europeans decided to take antique statues, particularly we're talking the bronze ones, and put them into the melting pot so that they could reuse the materials for the goods that they were running short of. They also had no trouble doing this because, of course, the subject matter they viewed as pagan and not worth keeping. Consequently, we today value any bronze original that we do have. We don't have a lot of them. Most of them were buried in some way, either in this case under the earth or, as we'll see in a minute, under the sea.